All right, hi, third grade. It is Friday, April 24th, and we are meeting to read and discuss more of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, I wanted to start out saying first that I am receiving your assignments, and you are doing a wonderful job. I want to tell you that I'm proud of you, and um, not only are your responses really awesome, but the fact that you're putting them in complete sentences with capital letters and punctuation is just really impressive, especially for being a third grader. So I just want you to know that I'm really proud of you and that you're doing a really good job. I know that this is probably really hard doing it like this. I mean, some of you may think it's not, but some of you probably do think it is. But that's even more impressive that you're able to do it like this and stick with it. So I do wish that we were meeting together and discussing and I could see your little faces and we could talk about it together, but this is the next best thing, I guess. So um, let's recap where we left off really quick. Uh, we ended with chapter 10 last week. We read nine and 10. Um, so in chapter 10, uh, we re re see that the beavers and the children packed up because they were worried that the white witch would come. So they're going to, they set out on a journey to try to get to the stone table um, and meet Aslan there. Uh, they go and hide in a hole in the ground and then they hear bells and they come up and they realize that Father Christmas is there and you know him as, remember who he really is, that is Santa Claus, that's right. So those of you that put Santa Claus, that's correct. Um, bringing gifts and would not the traditional toys that children would normally receive, but they got um, weapons. So that kind of gives you a, a sign as to what is going to happen in the future in the next few chapters that we're going to read. Um, then they, he also gives them some, uh, some tea and they're able to sit and have a nice breakfast before they have to end up and go continue on their journey. Um, did anybody put together why, remember, uh, the White Witch makes it always winter and never Christmas in Narnia? So did anyone, did, was anybody able to figure out, um, and I know that you were because I read your responses, but so we'll just skip that part, but uh, how was, how were they able to have uh, Father Christmas come when it's never Christmas there, and that is because Aslan is near. So remember, uh, the closer when Aslan gets, it seems the more the White Witch starts to lose her power because remember the beavers told the children that when he comes, um, her powers will be gone. So that's what's happening. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. We're going to read chapter 11 and 12 today. And we'll talk briefly about that. And like I've been doing, we'll go over the assignment for that. Uh, really quick, I'm sure I'll mention this again, but the 15th of May is the last day of school. We may have to read a little bit more than two chapters. Well, we will for sure in order to get this finished because I don't plan on having to have you do uh, an assignment on Friday at the last day of school. So we wouldn't want that. So um, I'll let you know what the plans are so you'll know what that is. Let's go ahead and start reading. We are going to go to, this is what your copy looks like if you're using this one online. Um, all right, so the title of this chapter is Aslan is Nearer, so let's get started. All right, Edmund, meanwhile, had been having a most disappointing time. When the dwarf had gone to get the sledge ready, he expected that the witch would start being nice to him, as she had been at their last meeting. But she said nothing at all, and when at last Edmund plucked up his courage to say, Please, your majesty, could I have some Turkish delight? You, you said, she answered, Silence, fool! Then she appeared to change her mind and said, as if to herself, And yet it will not do to have the brat fainting on the way. And once more clapped her hands, another dwarf appeared. Bring the human creature food and drink, she said. The dwarf went away and presently returned bringing an iron bowl with some water in it and an iron plate with a hunk of dry bread on it. He grinned in a repulsive manner as if as he set them down on the floor beside Edmund and said, Turkish delight for the little prince, ha ha ha. Take it away, said Edmund sulkily. I don't want any dry bread. But the witch suddenly turned on him with such a terrible expression on her face 
Then he apologized and began to nibble at the bread, though it was so stale he could hardly get it down. You may be glad enough of it before you taste bread again, said the witch. And while he was still chewing away, the first dwarf came back and announced that the sledge was ready. The white witch rose and went out, ordering Edmund to go with her. The snow was again falling as they came into the courtyard, but she took no notice of that and made Edmund sit beside her on the sledge. But before they drove off, she called Mogram, and he came bounding like an enormous dog to the side of the sledge. Take with you the swiftest of your wolves and go at once to the house of the beavers, said the witch, and kill whatever you find there. If they are already gone, then make it all speed to the stone table. But do not be seen. Wait for me there in hiding. I, meanwhile, must go many miles to the west before I find a place where I can drive across the river. You may overtake these humans before they reach the stone table. You will know what to do if you find them. All right, so here we see how evil the witch really is. I hear and obey, O queen, growled the wolf, and immediately he shot away into the snow and darkness as quickly as a horse can gallop. In a few minutes, he had called another wolf and was with him down on the dam and sniffing at the beaver's house, but of course, they found it empty. It would have been a dreadful thing for the beavers and the children if the night had remained fine for the wolf remained fine for the wolves when they have been able to follow their trail and 10 to one would have overtaken them. They had got to the cave. But now that the snow had begun again, the scent was cold and even the footprints were covered up. Meanwhile, the dwarf whipped up the reindeer and the witch and Edmund drove out under the archway and ran away into the darkness and the cold. This was a terrible journey for Edmund who had no coat before they had been going a quarter of an hour, all front of him was covered with snow. He soon stopped trying to shake it off because as quickly as he did that, a new lot gathered and he was so tired. Soon he was wet to the skin and oh, how miserable he was. It didn't look now as if the witch intended to make him king. All the things he had said to make himself believe that she was good and kind and that her side was really the right side sounded so sounded to him so silly now. He would have given anything to meet the others at this moment, even Peter. The only way to comfort himself now was to try to believe that the whole thing was a dream and that he might wake up at any moment. And as they went on, hour after hour, it did come to seem like a dream. Okay, so in that moment, we realize that Edmund really does realize now and know that the queen was evil and that she wasn't nice and even wishes that he was with his brother and sisters again which he's never felt like that before this lasted longer than i could describe even i even if i wrote the pages even if i wrote pages and pages about it but i will skip on to the time when the snow had stopped and the morning had come and they were racing along in the daylight and still they went on and on with no sound but the everlasting swish of the snow and the creaking of the reindeer's harness. And then at last, the white witch said, what have we here? Stop. And they did. How Edmund hoped she was going to say something about breakfast, but she had stopped for quite a different reason. A little way off at the foot of the tree sat a merry party, a squirrel and his wife with, four, with their children and two satyrs and a dwarf and an old dog fox on all stools round a table. Edmund couldn't quite see what they were eating, but it smelled lovely, and there seemed to be decorations of holly, and he wasn't at all sure that he didn't see something like plum pudding. At the moment when the sledge stopped, the fox, who was obviously in the oldest person present, had just risen to his feet, holding a glass in its right paw as if it was going to say something. But when the whole party saw the sledge stopping, and who was in it, and the gay, all the gaiety went out of their faces. The father squirrel stopped eating with his fork halfway to his mouth, and one of the satyrs stopped with his fork actually in his mouth, and the baby squirrel squeaked with terror. What is the meaning of this? asked the witch queen. Nobody answered. Speak, Furman, she said, or do you want my dwarf to find you a tongue with his whip? What is the meaning of all this gluttony, this waste, this self-indulgence? Where did you get all these things? Please, your majesty, said the fox. We were given them, 
and if I might make so bold to as to drink to your majesty's very good health, who gave them to you? said the witch. F -f -f Father Christmas, stammered the fox. What? roared the witch, springing from the sledge and taking a few strides nearer to the terrified animals. He has not been here. He cannot have been here. How dare you? But no, say you have been lying and you shall not and you shall now be forgiven. At that moment, one of the young squirrels lost its head completely. He has, he has, he has. It squeaked, beating its little spoon on the table. Edmund saw the witch bite her lips so that a drop of blood appeared on her white cheek. Then she raised her wand. Oh, don't, don't, please don't, shouted Edmund. But even while he was shouting, she had waved her wand and instantly where the merry party had been there were only statues of creatures, one with its stone fork fixed forever halfway to its stone mouth, seated round a stone table on which there were stone plates and a stone plum pudding. As for you, said the witch, giving Edmund a stunning blow on his face as she remounted the sledge, let that teach you to ask for spies, ask a favor for spies and traitors. Drive on. And Edmund, for the first time in this story, felt sorry for someone besides himself. It seemed so pitiful to think of those little stone figures sitting there all the silent days and all the dark nights, year after year, till the moss grew on them, and at last even their faces crumbled away. Now they were steadily racing on, and soon Edmund noticed that the snow which splashed against them as they rushed through it was much wetter than it had been at la than last night, all last night. At the time he noticed that he was feeling much less cold. It was also becoming foggy. In fact, every minute it grew foggier and warmer and the sledge was not running nearly as well as it had been running up until now. At first, he thought this was because the reindeer were tired, but soon he saw that he couldn't be, but that that couldn't be the real reason. The sledge jerked and skidded and kept on jolting as if it had stuck against stone. And however, the dwarf whipped the poor reindeer and the sledge went slower and slower. There also seemed to be a curious noise all around them, but the noise of their driving and jolting and the dwarf shouting at the reindeer prevented Edmund from hearing what it was until suddenly the sledge stuck so fast that it wouldn't go on at all. When that happened, there was a moment's silence, and in the silence, Edmund could at last listen to the other noise properly. A strange, sweet, rustling, chattering noise, and yet not so strange, for he'd heard it before, if only he could remember where. Then, all at once, he did remember. It was the noise of running water all around them, though out of sight. There were streams chattering, murmuring, bubbling, splashing, and even, in the distance, roaring, and his heart gave a great leap, though he hardly knew why, when he realized that the frost was over, and much nearer, there was a drip, drip, drip from the branches of all the trees, and then, as he looked at one tree, he saw a great load of snow slide off it for the first time since he'd entered Narnia. He saw the dark green of a fir tree, but he hadn't time to listen or watch any longer, for the witch said, don't sit staring, fool, get out and help. And of course, Edmund had to obey. He stepped out into the snow, but it was really only slush by now, and began helping the dwarf to get the sledge out of the muddy hole it had got in. They got it out in the end, and by being very cruel to the reindeer, the dwarf managed to get it on the move again, and they drove a little further, and now the snow was really melting in earnest, and patches of green grass were beginning to appear in every direction. Unless you've looked at a world of snow as long as Edmund had been looking at it, you will hardly be able to imagine what a relief those green patches were after the endless white. Then the sledge stopped again. It's no good, your majesty, said the dwarf. We can't sledge in this thaw. Then we must walk said the witch. We shall never overtake them walking, growled the dwarf. Not with the start they've got. Are you my counselor or my slave, said the witch. Do as you're told. Tie the hands of this human creature behind it and keep it hold, keep hold of the end of the rope and take your whip and cut the harness of the reindeer. They'll find their own way home. 
The dwarf obeyed, and in a few minutes, Edmund found himself being forced to walk as fast as he could with his hands tied behind him. He kept on slipping in the slush and mud and wet grass, and every time he slipped, the dwarf came, or the dwarf gave a, him a curse and sometimes a flick with the whip. The witch walked behind the dwarf and kept on saying, faster, faster. Every moment, the patches of green grew bigger and the patches of snow grew smaller. Every moment, more and more of the trees shook off their robes of snow. And soon, wherever you looked, instead of white shapes, you saw the dark green of firs or the black prickly branches of bare oaks and beeches and elms. Then the mist turned from white to gold and presently cleared away altogether. Shafts of delicious sunlight struck down onto the forest floor and overhead you could see a blue sky between the treetops. All right, so let's take a break for a second and what is happening? So Narnia, where it has always been winter, is starting to melt. It seems like the season is starting to change. So again, you have to ask, why is this happening? So you may know this answer already, but I'm not, so I'm not going to tell you, but why is this happening? All right, soon there were more wonderful things happening. Coming suddenly round a corner into a glade of silver birch trees, Edmund saw the ground covered in all directions with little yellow flowers and saladines. The noise of water grew louder. Presently, they actually crossed a stream. Beyond it, they found snowdrops growing. Mind your business, said the dwarf when he saw that Edmund had turned his head to look at them, and he gave the rope a vicious jerk. But of course, this didn't prevent Edmund from seeing. Only five minutes later, he noticed a dozen crocuses growing around the foot of an old tree, gold and purple and white, and then came a sound even more delicious than the sound of the water. Close behind the path, they were following a bird suddenly chirped from the branch of a tree. It was answered by the chuckle of another bird and a, li a little further off. And then, as if that had been a signal, there was a chattering and a chirping in every direction. And then a moment of full song, and within five minutes, the whole wood was ringing with birds' music. And wherever Edmund's eyes turned, he saw birds alighting on branches or sailing overhead, or chasing one another, or having little quarrels, or tidying up their feathers with their beaks. Faster, faster, said the witch. There was no trace of the fog now. The sky became bluer and bluer, and now there were white fluffy or white clouds hurrying across it from the time, from time to time. In the wide glades, there were primroses. A light breeze sprang up and scattered drops of moisture from the swaying branches and carried cool, delicious scents against the faces of the travelers. The trees began to come fully alive. The larches and the bir birches were covered with green, the labyrinths with gold, and soon the beech trees had put forth their delicate, transparent leaves. As the travelers walked under them, the light also became green. A bee buzzed across their path. This is no thaw, said the dwarf, suddenly stopping. This is spring. What are we to do? Your winter has been destroyed. I tell you, this is Aslan's doing. If either of you mentions that name again, said the witch, he shall instantly be killed. All right, so let's just review really quick chapter 11 before we get started. All right, so again, we can tell that Aslan is near because what is happening to the season in Narnia? So... Um, if you kind of get a, get a picture of your, in your mind of like this big white cloudy place that's, you know what it looks like when it snows outside. There's no sun, there's no clouds. It's just gray and white. And that's the way it is all the time in Narnia. And then all of a sudden, you know, they can see green, you know, birds are out flying around and chirping and waterfalls are becoming unfrozen and it's just becoming a really pretty place a place that even Edmund, of all people, thinks is very pretty. So, you know, if Edmund thinks it looks awesome, then it must be really awesome. Um, we first start to notice because her sledge starts getting stuck, and that's because the snow was melting and it was starting to be on muddy ground instead of frozen ground. And so we know that this is happening because Aslan is near. All right, so, and then we also learn, wow, how evil the witch really is, but we already really knew that, but Edmund didn't so much know it. So 
Um, she talks to him really ugly. She gives him horrible food to eat and even, even hits him in the face and then ties him up. And so she's, I mean, you can imagine how that must feel to think at first somebody was really nice and then to see them be so horrible. So Edmund kind of realizes now, all right, no, he doesn't kind of realize, he for sure realizes that she's really awful. All right, so Narnia begins to change just because Aslan is near and you can see that it is changing for the better. So this is a good sign. All right, let's move on to chapter 12. And I'm gonna take a drink really quick because my throat is starting to get dry. All right, so chapter 12 is called Peter's First Battle. So this kind of gives you um, an insight into what is going to happen in chapter 12. All right, while the dwarf and the white witch were saying this, miles away the beavers and the children were walking on after hour after hour into what seemed a delicious dream. Long ago, they had left their coats behind, and by now they had even stopped saying to one another, look, there's a kingfisher, or I say bluebells, or what was that lovely smell, or just listen to that thrush. They walked on in silence, drinking it all in, passing through patches of warm sunlight into cool green thickets, and out again into white mossy glades where tall elms raised the leafy roof far overhead, and then into dense masses of flowering current and among hawthorn bushes where the sweet smell of all, was almost overpowering. They had, just, they had been just as surprised as Edmund when they saw the winter vanishing and the whole wood passing in a few hours or so from January to May. They hadn't even known for certain, as the witch did, but, or that this was what would happen when Aslan came to Narnia. But they all knew that it was her spells which had produced the endless winter, and therefore they all knew when this magic spring began, that something had gone wrong and badly wrong with the witch's schemes. And after the thaw had been going on for some time, they all realized that the witch would no longer be able to use her sledge. After that, they didn't hurry so much, and they allowed themselves more rest and longer ones. They were pretty tired by now, of course, but not what I'd call bitterly tired only slow and feeling very dreamy and quiet inside, as one does when one is coming to the end of a long day in the open. Susan had a slight blister on her heel on one heel. They had left the course of the big river some time ago, for one had to turn a little to the right, that meant a little to the south, to reach the place of the stone table. Even if this had not been their way, they couldn't have kept to the river valley once the thaw began for with all the melting snow, the river was soon in flood, a wonderful, roaring, thundering, yellow flood, and their path would have been underwater. And now the sun got low, and the light got redder, and the shadows got longer, and the flowers began to think about closing. Not long now, said Mr. Beaver, and began leading them uphill across some very deep, springy moss. It felt nice under their tired feet, in a place where only tall trees grew, very wide apart. The climb coming at the end of the long day made them all pant and blow. And just as Lucy was wondering whether she could really get to the top without another long rest, suddenly they were at the top. And this is what they saw. They were on a green open space from which you could look down on the forest spreading as far as one could see in every direction except right ahead. There, far to the east, was something twinkling and moving by gum, whispered Peter to Susan. The sea in the very middle of this open hilltop was the stone table. It was a great grim slab of gray stone supporting, supported on four upright stones. It looked very old and it was cut all over with strange lines and figures that might be the letters of an unknown language. They gave you a curious feeling when you looked at them. The next thing they saw was a pavilion pitched on one side of the open place. A wonderful, a wonderful pavilion it was, and especially now when the light of the setting sun fell upon it. <clears throat> With sides of what looked like yellow silk and cords of crimson and tent pegs of ivory, and high above it on a pole a banner which bore a red rampant lion fluttering in the breeze which was blowing in their faces from the far off sea. 
While they were looking at this, they heard a sound of music on their right. And turning in that direction, they saw what they had come to see. So what do you think it was? Aslan stood in the center of a crowd of creatures who had grouped themselves around him in the shape of a half moon. There were tree women and well women, dryads and naiads, and they <clears throat> and they used to be called that they and as they used to be called in our world, who had stringed instruments. It was they who had made the music. There were four great centaurs. The horse part of them was like were like huge English farm horses, and the man part was like stern but beautiful giants. There was also a unicorn and a bull with the head of a man and a pelican and an eagle and a great dog. And next to Aslan stood two leopards of whom one carried his crown and the other his standard. But as for Aslan himself, the beavers and the children didn't know what to do or say when they saw him. People who have not been in Arnia sometimes think that a thing cannot be good and terrible at the same time. If the children had ever thought so, they were cured of it now. For when they tried to look at Aslan's face, they just caught a glimpse of the golden mane and the great royal, royal, solemn, overwhelming eyes. And when they found they couldn't look at him and went all trembly, go on, whispered Mrs. Mr. Beaver. No, whispered Peter, you first. No, sons of Adam, before animals, whispered Mr. Beaver back again. All right, so one thing I want to point out, because this is one of your questions, is right here when it says, people who have not been in Narnia sometimes think that it cannot be good and terrible at the same time. So part of your thought question this week is going to try to be to answer what you think it means when something cannot be good and terrible at the same time. So you might remember this part right here and come back and reread it a few times if you struggle with that question. All right, so Susan whispered, Peter, what about you, ladies first? No, you're the eldest, whispered Susan, and of course, the longer they went on doing this, the more awkward they felt. Then at last, Peter realized that it was up to him. He drew his sword and raised it to the salute and hastily saying to the others, come on, pull yourselves together. He advanced to the lion and said, we have come, Aslan. Welcome, Peter, son of Adam, said Aslan. Welcome, Susan and Lucy, daughters of Eve. Welcome, he beaver and she beaver. His voice was deep and rich and somehow took the fidgets of them out of them. They now felt glad and quiet, and it didn't seem awkward to them to stand and say nothing. But where is the fourth? asked Aslan. He, was, he has tried to betray them and join the white witch, oh Aslan, said Mr. Beaver. And then something made Peter say, that was partly my fault, Aslan. I was angry with him, and I think that helped him, that helped him to go wrong. All right, so Peter's going to be the good brother and kind of take up and make excuses for Edmund, isn't he? And Aslan said nothing either to excuse Peter or to blame him, but merely stood looking at him with his great unchanging eyes. And it seemed to all of them that there was nothing to be said. Please, Aslan, said Lucy, can anything be done to save Edmund? All shall be done, said Aslan, but it may be harder than you think. And then he was silent again for some time. Up to that moment, Lucy had been thinking how royal and strong and peaceful his face looked. Now it suddenly came into her head that he looked sad as well. But next minute, that expression was quite gone. The lion shook his mane and clapped his paws together. Terrible paws, thought Lucy, if he didn't know how to velvet them, and said, Meanwhile, let the feast be prepared. Ladies, take these daughters of Eve to the pavilion and minister to them. And when the girls had gone, Aslan laid his paw, and though it was velveted, it was very heavy on Peter's shoulder, and said, Come on, or come, son of Adam, and I will show you a far-off sight of the castle where you are to be king. And Peter, with his sword still drawn in his hand, went with the lion to the eastern edge of the hilltop, and there was a beautiful, a beautiful sight met their eyes. The sun was setting behind their backs. All right, so we just learned that who's going to be king, and it's going to be Peter. 
All right, that meant that the whole country below them lay in the evening light, forests and hills and valleys, and winding away like a silver snake the lower part of the great river. And beyond all this, miles away was the sea, and beyond the sea was the sky full of clouds, which were just turning rose color with the reflection of the sunset. But just where the land of Narnia met the sea, in fact, at the mouth of the great river, there was something on a little hill shining. It was shining because it was a castle. And of course, the sunlight was reflected from all the windows, which looked like Peter, or which looked toward Peter and the sunset. But to Peter, it looked like a great star resting on the seashore. That, oh man, said Aslan, is Care Paravel of the four thrones, and one of which you must sit as king. I show it to you because you are the firstborn, and you will be high king over all the rest. And once more Peter said nothing, for at that moment a strange noise woke the silence suddenly. It was like a bugle, but richer. It's your sister's horn, said Aslan to Peter in a low voice, so low as to be almost a purr if it is not disrespectful to think of a lion purring. Okay, so remember Father Christmas um, is, gave Susan this bugle and what was going to happen, what was supposed to happen when she was going to, when she blew it, that there was trouble and that help would always come. All right, for a moment, Peter, Peter did not understand. And then when he saw all the other creatures start forward and heard Aslan say with a wave of his paw, back let the prince win his spurs he did understand and set off running as hard as he could to the pavilion and there he saw a dreadful sight the naiads and the dryads were scattering in every direction lucy was running toward him as fast as her short legs would carry her and her face was as white as paper and then he saw susan make a dash for a tree and swing herself up followed by a huge gray beast at first, Peter thought it was a bear, and then he saw that it looked like an Alsatian, though it was far too big to be a dog, and then he realized that it was a wolf, a wolf standing on its hind paws, with its front paws against the tree trunk, snapping and snarling. All the hair on its back stood up on end. Susan had not been able to get higher than the second branch, big branch, and one of her legs hung down so that her foot was only an inch or two above the snapping teeth. Peter wondered why she did not get higher or at least take a bigger or a better grip. And then he realized that she was just going to faint and that if she fainted, she would fall off. Peter did not feel very brave. Indeed, he felt he was going to be sick, but that made no difference to what he had to do. He rushed straight up to the monster and aimed a slash of his sword at, his, at its side. That stroke never reached the wolf. Quick as lightning, it turned round, its eyes flaming and its mouth wide open in a howl of anger. If it had not been so angry, if it had not been so angry that it simply had to howl, it would have got him by the throat at once. As it was, though, all this happened too quickly for Peter to think at, think at that, think at all. He had just time to duck and plunge his sword as hard as he could between the brute's forelegs into his heart, and then came a horrible, confused moment like something in a nightmare. He was tugging and pulling at the wolf, and the wolf seemed neither alive nor dead, and its bared teeth knocked against its forehead, and everything was blood and heat and hair. A moment later, he found that the monster lay dead, and that he had, and he had drawn his sword out of it and was straightening his back and rubbing the sweat off his face and out of his eyes. He felt tired all over. Then after a bit, Susan came down from the tree, she and Peter felt pretty shaky when they met, and I won't say there wasn't kissing and crying on both sides, but in Narnia, no one thinks any of the worse of you for that. Quick, quick, shouted the voice of Aslan. Centaurs, eagles, I see another wolf in the thickets. There, behind you. He, was, he has just started away. After him, all of you. He will be going to his mistress. Now is your chance to find the witch and rescue the fourth son of Adam. And instantly, with a thunder of hooves and beating of wings, a dozen or so of the swiftest creatures disappeared into the gathering darkness. Peter, still out of breath, turned and saw Aslan close at hand. You have forgotten to clean your sword, said Aslan. It was true. 
Peter blushed when he looked at the bright blade and saw it all smeared with the wolf's hair and blood. He stooped down and wiped it, off, wiped it quite clean on the grass and then wiped it quite dry on his coat. Hand it to me and kneel, son of Adam, said Aslan. And when Peter had done so, he struck him with the flat of the blade and said, rise up, Sir Peter, Wolf Spain, and whatever happens, never forget to wipe your sword. All right, so that's the end of chapter 12. All right, so um, in this moment right here, do you know what it was that he did, what Aslan did with the sword to Peter? So that's something that people do when they are knighted or become a knight. So, um, all right, so Peter fights his first battle and he wins. And Susan uses her bugle that Father Christmas gave him, gave her, and help comes immediately on the way. So that's how that's going to work. All right. Um, so you kind of get an idea of what's going to happen when um, the White Witch gets there. Uh, you kind of get a clue because of how she's turned all these people into statues. You kind of get an idea because of how mean she's talked to Edmund and what she's done. So by the time she gets to meet Ashlyn, it's probably going to be pretty ugly. So we'll be reading about that in the future as that comes up. All right, I am going to share with you your assignment for next week. That is over chapters 11 and 12. Okay, so um, you have all next week to work on it. If you could just email it to me by next before next Friday, which all of you are doing that. I just thought I would give you a reminder. So, all right, so for chapter 11, um, number one is, what is it that makes Edmund realize that the White Witch isn't nice like he thought she was? And then I put, it would be awesome if you could describe more than one. So chapter 11 kind of gave like two or three, maybe even four examples of what, what it actually was that made Edmund realize that, oh my gosh, she's so horrible. So um, if you could describe, you know, a couple of those or all of them if you want. If you want to go above and beyond, you can do all of them. That would be great too. All right. Um, number two, what does the White Witch order the Wolf Mogram to do? So she's got this big, powerful, in my mind, it's like this giant wolf. And what does she order him to do? So, which is really horrible and awful. All right. Number three, what happens when Edmund what happens that makes Edmund start to have feelings about others instead of himself? So this is kind of a big deal, I think, in this part of the story, because the whole time from the beginning that we've read about Edmund, we see he's selfish, he's mean, um, he lies, and he just doesn't really seem to care about anybody. And then this one thing in chapter 11 happens, and it's like he actually feels bad for someone else instead of himself, which is a really big deal because up until this point, we've never, he never, remember, he never felt bad for Lucy. Remember how she would cry and try to get him to tell the, the others that he'd seen Narnia and he said he didn't and she cried and he didn't feel bad at all. So this is a really big deal in chapter 11, what happens that he actually feels bad for someone else other than himself. So what was that? All right, and then number four, describe what is happening to Narnia as Edmund the White Witch and the Dwarf are traveling to the stone table. Um, I could have also added in there that also while the beavers and the children are traveling to the stone table, I mean, it was happening all over. So what was that? Um, give two or three examples to support your answer. So what I mean by that is, you know, when you answer what was happening, as they were traveling to the stone table, give like two or three examples that show what was happening. So um, that's what I mean on that. And then chapter 12, write a summary for chapter 12, at least five sentences. It can be more, but just 
five at least, no less than five. Um, this chapter had a lot of details in it, so be sure to only include the most important parts. So I know that um, Miss Lamorant and Miss Wilkie have also, and we have also talked about um, how to write summaries and how, remember, we're just going to include the most important parts. And I'll just be honest, the reason I chose chapter 12 is because chapter 12 has a lot of details in it. So I thought chapter 12 would be perfect practice on trying to get you to just talk about the most important parts. So remember, um, summaries can kind of tend to get long because in our mind, we want to start like writing all the details down, but that's not a summary. We're not going to rewrite chapter 12. You're just going to pick like the most important parts and write a summary for chapter 12. Like, for example, the best way to do this is like, just pretend like you and a friend were at recess and you were about to line up and you were about to go to class and somebody was saying, hey, what was chapter 12 in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe about? And he, maybe he said to you, your friend said to you, um, I only have like a minute. You can't make it longer than a minute. So what would you try to tell them that chapter 12 was about in like one minute, really short? So that might be one way you can look at it. And also, if you have to write it a couple of times and it's really long, that's fine. Write it, make it long, and then look at how you can cut it down. So I can't wait to look at those because I know this is going to be challenging because chapter 12 had a lot of details. So, all right. So that's the end of that. All right. So you can email those to me next week and next week we will read um, 13 and 14 and then we'll only have three chapters left. So uh, that was that and I hope that you have a really good weekend and I hope that you have a really good week next week and good luck on working on all your assignments whether it's mine or others. So I'll see you next Friday and bye.